Good morning, and thank you for joining our webinar on biological safety. Uh, while we wait for a few more participants to join us, we'd like to share with you our corporate video that demonstrates LASIK Group's capabilities as a laboratory and scientific service provider. Founded in 1945 and operating out of South Africa with our head office here in Cape Town, LASIK has for the last 75 years been supporting customers both in South Africa and the rest of Africa with dependable laboratory and scientific solutions. We work across public and private healthcare, tertiary, research and manufacturing communities. Our office space has recently been renovated. We've raised it a floor to accommodate for additional warehousing space below. Our open product and sales floor allows for easy collaboration between our teams, ensuring quick turnaround times on inquiries. You'll see some open desks here. That is because in order to ensure that we safeguard our staff from transmitting COVID, we are limiting the number of people in the office daily. Our support teams, IT, finance, marketing, tenders and logistics are all centrally located here at our head office. To ensure sustainability and self-reliance, our facilities are fully equipped with an independent filtered borehole water supply and power generators. We are also in the process of installing a solar energy system. We have multiple collaborative spaces available. These examples are pre-COVID and explain the lack of face masks. Our auditorium is the perfect space for on-site workshops and seminars with our customers and suppliers. Our meeting areas are equipped with state-of-the-art video conferencing technology, which allows us to easily connect to all over the world. Our demonstration rooms, both in Cape Town and Johannesburg, are fully equipped to host customers for a hands-on experience with our products. Whether you are troubleshooting and need our expertise, or if there's a new instrument you are keen to try out, we have the facilities to accommodate this. With just under 8,000 square meters of warehousing space, we work closely with our partners to ensure stock availability. Our supply chain is optimized to land stock at the best possible price, but is agile to allow for expedited shipments. Our product teams monitor the market to anticipate demand trends, and we then forecast accordingly. Our cold storage facilities are monitored remotely 24 hours a day, which means that we're able to react immediately should a problem arise. Our 24 service engineers and technicians are well experienced and highly qualified. We have three NSF 49 accredited engineers trained at the highest level of biological safety. This equips our teams to validate, service and repair all major brands of safety cabinets to ensure the protection of users. We are ISO 17025 accredited for volume, temperature and mass metrology, allowing us to calibrate pipettes, balances and temperature equipment ranging from ultra-low freezers to ovens and even furnaces. Our logistics team handle both our inbound and outbound shipments from and to all over the world. We have representatives from our freight forwarding partners on site who support the quick handling of shipments. At LASIK, we facilitate higher learning, maximizing the potential of our employees. We have to date assisted 84 of our LASIK family to reach their dreams of a better education. Our intern program for aspiring young professionals with a passion for science has mentored 38 South Africans, of which LASIK has permanently employed 12. A quick overview of our core business units. Consumables. An extensive stock holding ensures the availability of essential everyday consumable products. We work closely with our customers on demand forecasting. Depending on your quality and price point pressures, we have multiple tiers of product available. Laboratory instruments. Our experience, buying power and strong relationships with manufacturers brings world-class technology to end users cost effectively. We offer a wide range of instruments applicable to a variety of laboratory environments. We also offer installation, setup and end user training, as well as preventative maintenance and servicing. Biotechnology. Our range extensively covers RNA, DNA and protein purification. Our PCR solutions include technology for endpoint, real-time and droplet digital PCR. 
we offer a wide range of immunoassays for clinical and veterinary uses. This includes ELISA kits, rapid diagnostic tests, and customizable tests for urinalysis and drugs of abuse. We also offer a wide range of microscopy stains and staining equipment to cover all fields of biology. Sample collection. We work with global funding partners on addressing sample collection needs throughout Africa, primarily for the diagnosis and viral load monitoring of HIV. Our kit packing facility here in Cape Town is ISO 13485 accredited. We also pack sample collection kits for HPV, TB and COVID. These are 100% customizable. Laboratory Furniture Our team design, manufacture and install fit-for-purpose customized lab furniture considering the application to ensure optimized workflow. Manufactured locally and shipped flat-packed all over Africa, our teams also support on installation. LASIK Education We manufacture mobile lab kits and science products for schools who don't have access to laboratories giving little scientists hands-on experience. Offering educator training ensures these experiments are delivered with confidence and safely. We have offices in all South African major city centres, as well as additional support in outlying areas. Our international team actively supports Sub-Saharan Africa and even beyond the continent in developing nations. Our sales teams and end users are supported by product managers who make up our consumables, instrument and biotechnology teams. These product managers are experienced in lab environments and have received extensive training from our manufacturing partners. Okay, thank you once again for joining our um, webinar on biological safety. A quick mention of the house rules. All participants' videos and microphones will be remotely deactivated. If you have any questions during the presentation, please place them in the chat. Um, all the questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So the presentation will be approximately 45 minutes to an hour. And once this is finished, um, then you're welcome to leave or you can stay for the Q&A session. Just a note that this is quite a technical webinar. We feel that a biological safety cabinet is vital for any laboratory requiring safe working areas for the user, free from microbiological contamination. So in this webinar, we're going to discuss the various types of biological safety cabinets, tips for working safely in your BSc, and finally certification as well as key standards applicable to biological safety cabinets. To introduce the webinar panelists, my name is Kylie Davis. I'm the Instrument Portfolio Manager here at LASIK. I'm going to be monitoring the chat and administering the Q&A session. Carla Jacobs is our Product Manager responsible for Biological Safety Cabinets. She'll be available to answer any questions um, that are product specific. And then lastly, our main speaker this morning is Stephen Smith. He's an expert in the field of biological safety with his full NSF 49 accreditation as a biological safety cabinet field certifier. Steve has many years of practical experience working with laboratories all over Africa to ensure their biological safety equipment and practices are safe and up to standard. Thanks, Steve. You can take it away. Hi, so morning, everybody. As Kylie mentioned, I'm Steve Smith. I'm the head of the uh, engineering here at LASIC. And I'm going to take you through the, um, the Biological Safety Cabinet webinar this morning. We're going to deal with the basically the main purpose of the units, how they operate, different classes, and then finally give you some tips and tricks on when you are using the cabinets and also how we certify them. Uh, a very important part of these cabinets is that they are certified correctly um, as they are primarily the the main containment device in your laboratory. So it's very important that they are kept operationally correct. So let's start off with the purpose. So the purpose of a BSC um, is to provide three types of protection. It's designed to protect you, the personnel, it's designed to protect the product from contamination. And thirdly, which is sometimes forgotten, it's also to, um, designed to, to provide environmental protection from contaminants within the cabinet. So it, 
it differentiates itself from other types of air containment devices in that it it's it uh, provides the three types of protection so how does this protection work so basically the overall operating principle of a bsc is that it uses airflow two different airflows and it uses HEPA filters. So the combination of those mechanics is what provides the cabinet with its, uh, with its capability to, to provide the protection. So what we're looking at here is one of the airflows. We're using a smoke visualization test to visually see what the air is actually doing inside the cabinet. It's important to remember here that there's two airflows and this is demonstrating the first airflow that we're gonna look at is called downflow. So this is a a side view of what the air pattern looks like inside a correctly operating safety cabinet. The second airflow is the inflow. So what's important to notice here is that the air is being drawn into the cabinet through the front air grill. It's not passing over onto the work surface. It's now pulling in through the front grill and joining in with the downflow. So at that grill, is what we call our air barrier. And that is what's keeping the operator and the product safe. So very, very important not to disturb the airflows at that front grill by placing any objects over them. You'll see in a later video that we've got some demonstrations to show you what actually happens when you, when you do place objects there. But the prime point to take out of this uh, slide is that that front grill is what's providing the protection for you. So be very careful not to interfere with the integrity of the airflow at that point. You can also see here that the airflow is not, is not being drawn into the cabinet completely. So you do often see in some of the labs, they put a, a small piece of tissue paper or something stuck onto the glass sash. Uh, it has really of no use. It's not showing you anything other than that there's something happening in the cabinet. So please don't rely on a piece of tissue paper on your front sash to give you some confidence that the cabinet's working because it's actually showing you nothing. So um, these are the two basic airflows. And then the next, um, the next thing that we need to look at is how these airflows are filtered. So what we utilize here is a, a filter called a HEPA filter, stands for high efficiency particulate air. Important here is the third word, particulate. It means that the HEPA filter does not contain gases or vapors, only particulates. So how a HEPA filter works, it uses three different mechanics. Um, I won't go too much into the detail, but basically the interception, the impaction and the diffusion techniques that a HEPA filter uses react differently to different size particles. So if you look at the graph below, it's a graph of efficiency of the filter compared to particle size. So you can see that it has a distinct dip around a certain point. And at that point, that's where the filter has its biggest challenge. And um, that particle size we have determined is 0 0.3 microns. So when we do our field certifications, and when we're testing HEPA filters, we make sure we test them at that critical point so that if it can produce the integrity to stop 99.99% of that 0 0.3 particle, it means that all the other particle sizes will definitely be contained as the efficiency increases on both sides of that particle size. Important point here, HEPA filters do not capture gases and vapors. So if you're working in a biological safety cabinet with uh, any reagents of producing fumes or vapors, just be aware that these will pass through a HEPA filter. Um, they do not get contained. This is for aerosol capture only. So just a brief summary of what containment cabinets are available. And there is often some confusion. I've seen it in more than one lab in Africa where a laminar flow cabinet has been confused with a biological safety cabinet. I think the confusion also comes in, in the many years ago that the term laminar flow cabinet was also used for a biological safety cabinet. The two terms were interchanged when these days we are a little bit stricter with the terminology. So a laminar flow cabinet, the most important thing to remember, does not provide any protection for personnel. So if you're doing a risk assessment in your laboratory and you determine you need to have 
protection for personnel, then a laminar flow is not the correct containment device used. You can see that the uh, biological safety cabinet is. So it's very important that the two don't get confused. And they can be some confusion with some of the manufacturers in that the, the devices look almost exactly the same. They have the same control panels, the same size, same coloring. There's a distinctive difference in that they generally do not have that front air grill. So if you are sitting in front of a cabinet that doesn't have that air grill, where I showed you where the two air flows meet, then you're not sitting in front of a BSC. You're probably sitting in front of a laminar flow and you have no personal protection. So very, very important that you make sure that those two don't get confused. So if we look at the laminar flow cabinet, which is not a BSC, it provides protection for the product. It uses a HEPA filter, brings in, brings in the air from the lab through a HEPA filter down onto the product and then out into the lab. So basically only one form of protection, the product. Chemical fume hoods, uh, as they say, they're designed to take away fumes from whatever product you're using. The difference with them, they do provide personal protection. They do provide environmental protection, but they do not contain HEPA filters, as we know that HEPA filters do not contain fumes. So generally they are extracted with ducting out into the atmosphere. Class 1 BSCs are very few and far between these days. They are designed just to provide protection for personnel, but not for your product. They work by bringing, I will show you some slides a little bit later on the, on the schematics of how these work, but important to note here, no protection for the product. So this table gives you an idea of how to select a cabinet for your need. And we're gonna concentrate primarily on the class two cabinets. That's what is in 90% of your lamps. Just to point out that it's very important that this, these cabinets don't get confused. So make sure you have the right cabinet for the right job. So this is a class one cabinet, which uh, it was a much more popular many years ago. It's designed to protect the personnel and the environment. So the products that we're using on the work surface have already been exposed to the environment. So we're not worried about them being contaminated. I'm just worried about me getting contaminated and the environment. So the airflow is drawn into the front of the cabinet, up through a fan, sometimes through ducting. And important here, it goes through a HEPA filter. So the air that's being exhausted into the lab, if it's a freestanding one, will have been filtered. The typical uses here is toxic powder weighting. There's a few other um, uses that are used for it, but it's not a very common. Um, it's not a very common cabinet these days because people would rather now just prefer to buy class two, in that they then have product protection as well for future experiments sample uh, manipulations. Uh, this is a clock, we now into the class two, which uh, are designed to offer those three forms of protection. This is a class two, so just to briefly give you a summary, class two cabinets are divided into different types. So we have a type A and a type B. And of the type A's, we have two different types. This is a type A1. They do not, allow these cabinets in labs in many parts of the world anymore since 2008. The reason being that if you look at the diagram, you can see where the, where the arrows are red, that means that that air is contaminated. And at the bottom of the unit is a fan and it's bringing in the, bringing in the air through the front of the grill and pushing it up to the HEPA filters at the top. The problem with these cabinets is that that air going up on the left-hand side is under what we call positive pressure. So on an aging cabinet, it's very likely that you can get some corrosion, maybe a hole develops, a rivet comes out or something. So the danger there is that contaminated air is under positive pressure. So it will be passed into the lab, which is obviously very dangerous. So these have now been taken out of use and replaced with the common A2 cabinet, which is the one that we're gonna primarily deal with today. You can see from the diagram here, what's the main difference is that that fan, the motor blower that's providing the inflow and the downflow has now been positioned at the top of the unit. So the air that's coming in underneath from the inflow, underneath the work surface and up through what we call a plenum, and then being drawn into the fan at the top is under what we call now negative pressure. So if we develop a leak in the chassis of the cabinet, 
the worst that will happen now is that we're going to just draw air from the laboratory into the unit where it will be filtered. So no danger of any contaminated air being forced out into the lab. So if you do come across in some of the very old labs, I still see them, um, a class one, I would make sure that it's been certified correctly because if there's any leaks, you do have this danger of positive pressure bringing the uh, contaminant out into the lab. So the basic um, idea of a class two lab is it's a recirculating cabinet. It recirculates 70% of the air that's drawn into the unit and 30% is exhausted into the laboratory. It provides the three types of protection, personnel, product, and environment, and typically used in P2 labs or BSL2 level labs for various manipulations, bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic. Uh, important point to note here is that generally these units do not have ducting on the exhaust. There are some occasions where we do use ducting, but the majority of them are used as standalone units in laboratories. So of vital importance is that the exhaust filter is not leaking, as if it is, any contaminated air will then obviously be passed into the lab. So again, it calls for correct field certification that these HEPA filters are correctly checked using the correct equipment. This is it, we're moving on now. So from the class A's, we move to a the, the second type of the uh, sorry, types, from type A, we now move on to the type B. The type B, the difference is that the difference between a type B and a type A is a vital difference in that it contains one fan for the downflow and it requires an external fan placed somewhere on the building to provide the inflow. So not standalone units, they do require ducting. The B1 cabinet has been largely phased out in phase of, in, uh, in uh, favor of the B2, as it's a much easier cabinet to operate without having specialized training for the operators. 100% um, total exhaust, so in this case, no recirculation. Mostly used in P3 labs or BSL3 labs. The reason that this cabinet is for the, um, is on the higher end of the protection is that it contains ducting and an external fan. So in the case of perhaps an exhaust leak, it does mean that that contaminated air coming through the leaking exhaust will be extracted out through the lab into the outside. One of the, one of the prime concerns with these cabinets, which I've seen in many labs in Africa, is that the external fan is what's providing the inflow. The internal fan is what's providing the downflow. So if we have a problem with the external fan, which most of the time we can't see, it's sitting perhaps on a wall outside or on the roof. If that fan fails, it means that we do not have any inflow now, but we still have downflow, which means downflow without inflow, that downflow air is gonna be pushed into the lab. And generally in these labs, we're in BSL three level lab. So you can imagine the danger. So it's very, very important. First of all, these units are installed by engineers who can certify them correctly and more importantly, that there needs to be a communication between the exhaust fan and the cabinet. So in the event of the exhaust fan failing, we have a set um, uh, rule that we have that within 15 seconds of the exhaust fan failing or reducing by 20%, it needs to switch the unit off and provide an alarm. And this is not always done correctly. The alarm system is not set up properly. I've just seen a lab now where the exhaust fan was actually missing. They were still using the the lab so dangerous so um, if you do work with these b2 cabinets be very careful that you get them certified by correctly certified engineers especially the uh, safety interlock mechanisms between the exhaust and the downflow fans so just a summary of the types of bscs remember these are all bscs now not laminar flows we have the type a which gives us recirculation the exhaust is mentioned there is discretionary. Uh, so in some of the labs, we do provide some ducting as an additional protection. With the type B, the exhaust is mandatory because, as I mentioned, we do have to have two fans and it needs to be an external fan providing the inflow. There is another type of BSC which we come across in the BSL, sometimes in a BSL3, more often in a BSL4 level lab. 
which is a glove box or a class three. In this case, we do not have any open aperture or a, a sash, sliding sash. We have, you can see here we have gloves. So the operator needs to place the hands inside and we test it using different techniques. It doesn't actually fall under our NSF 49 field certification test. We have different tests for these. So these cabinets are a lot rarer, but it's just to point out that this is the, this is the high end of safety cabinets. As I mentioned earlier, there was a some in some labs they do they do require some additional protection on A2 units. Just remembering that the A2 units are able to operate as standalone units. They have one fan providing the inflow and the downflow, so no external fan. But to provide additional protection in case of the exhaust filter leaking, which is a possibility. They request we supply some ducting so that if there is a leak, the contaminated air gets passed out into the atmosphere. Of big importance here is that these, these ducting connections are connected through what we call a canopy. In other words, we don't directly connect ducting onto the outlet of the exhaust. The reason being here is that in a worst case scenario, we don't know if something might happen to this ducting in the roof, maybe it gets blocked. In that case, the exhaust air going through the ducting has nowhere to go to. So what it does is it turns around and it gets blended in with the downflow, increasing the downflow to a, a dangerous level where it can come out into the lab. So what the canopy does, it provides an escape route for that air. In the case of the ducting getting blocked, what happens is there's little flaps on it. So if the pressure rises in the ducting, these flaps will lift and rather than the exhaust air dangerously now being diverted downwards, it exhausts through these flaps, setting off an alarm. The air is obviously still filtered, so inherently safe. It's coming through the HEPA filter, but it's a, a safety mechanism to make sure that we don't, we don't disturb the downflow velocities, which is critical to that air in the, the uh, air barrier. So if you are in a lab using an A2 cabinet, there's normally some classification on the cabinet itself. It will, it will mention A2. And you see it has ducting. Just examine that the ducting has been connected through a canopy. Again, in many parts of Africa, I've seen where it's been directly coupled to an exhaust without a canopy. It can be dangerous. So just something to check. If it's an A2 with ducting, it needs to be connected through this canopy. Here we have an example now of the type B. So remembering that type B is the one that uses an external fan. The ducting here is obviously then needing to be hard ducted, otherwise we would be drawing air in from the lab. But this is just an example of what a B2 cabinet looks like. The ducting disappears out into the ceiling, can go many meters, maybe onto the side of the wall. And there is the external fan, which is providing the inflow. So vitally important that this installation is done by certified engineers and then regularly check to make sure that the alarm systems between the exhaust and the downflow are working correctly. So in this case scenario, if we were working in front of this cabinet and the exhaust fan failed, internally the downflow would carry on working if the alarm wasn't working properly and we would have air coming straight out from the sash into the lab. So Critically important that these are certified correctly. So when you are selecting a BSC, here's some points as to do a risk assessment, what agents are you handling, the procedures need to be followed, personnel factors. An important part of this is the personnel factor that um, we can have a fully validated and certified safety cabinet, but if the staff are not well trained, capable of performing the task safely, it can be made inherently unsafe by unsafe practices. So uh, when we do provide certification of cabinets, we do include training on the staff just to make sure that they're using the cabinet correctly. And of critical importance is to make sure they understand how the cabinet works, how the air flows work, because it's often misunderstood, especially in a, a class two, how the air flows actually operate. And without that understanding, it's quite easy to disturb these air flows. So, the uh, this training of the staff is one of the um, critical points that we apply when we, when we validate these cabinets. 
This is just a risk assessment of biosafety level, which is basically done by the lab managers to see which cabinet will suit which biosafety level. Just a point to make here in South Africa, the BSL levels often referred to as P level. So we have a P2, P3 lab, P4 labs. Um, they're both interchangeable. So this would be a this would be a risk assessment done by the lab management and the supplier to determine which cabinet is suitable for which biological safety level facility. So when we do a facility assessment, when we are installing, or when a cabinet needs to be installed, there's certain parameters that we need to look at carefully. Uh, we can see from the design and operation of a safety cabinet that it relies on airflow to keep the personnel and the product and the environment safe. So this airflow is generally of quite low velocities. It's around about 0 0.3 to 5 meters per second, which is not very high. So it doesn't take much to disturb these airflows, especially the inflow. So when we position these cabinets, we need to make sure primarily that there's no external influence on these airflows. Um, so we would not position them next to doors that are regularly opened, certainly not windows. Uh, the prime culprit most of the time for disturbing these airflows are air conditioning units, which are either HVAC or split units, but they do provide much higher airflows than the cabinet is providing. So they quite easily disturb the inflow if they're positioned in the, in the way that the airflow is directed at the front of the cabinet. So one of the, the main concerns is when we position a cabinet in a laboratory, that we need to look out for any external factors, specifically air conditioning, that will disturb these, uh, disturb these airflows. This is just a brief diagram of what we would look for just to optimize the positioning of where we would put a cabinet. It's not always ideal in some labs. It's never a perfect positional place where we can put it, but there's always a, there's always a best case scenario. And when, when, we, when, when cabinets have been installed for the first time, they still need to be validated. So they still need to pass the tests designed for NSF. And if the cabinet's in a position where it's being influenced, it will fail the test. So in that case, we have to make a plan. But generally, we generally, if it's not 100%, we get it to the point where it's operational and passes the tests. Another point to make here, um, the main point I think just to look at is if you look at the first line, that the laminar airflow workstation protects the product and doesn't protect anything else. So again, do not confuse a laminar airflow workstation, which is not a safety cabinet, with a safety cabinet. The other, the other requirements are generally determined by which samples are being manipulated and in, in which safety level. So this would be determined by the lab management doing a risk assessment to see which cabinet is suitable for which facility that you're working in. So there's various standards in the world which are used to certify cabinets. The cabinet itself is certified at the factory by one of these standards. We operate with the all three, but we generally for the field certification, which means that some engineer needs to go on site and validate a cabinet. We operate to the NSF 49 standard, which is the gold standard in the world. It means that the person, not the company, the person who is coming to do the certification has been accredited and needs to be re-accredited on, on a regular basis, but he's able to perform these tests to this level and certify the cabinet on site. So here we're just going to show you a brief video of some of the tests that are done when we do field certification. Be sure to familiarize yourself with your operation and maintenance manual. HEPA filters, whether part of a building exhaust system or part of a cabinet, will require replacement when the airflow is no longer sufficient and filter load has reached a capacity. Filters must be decontaminated before removal. To contain the formaldehyde gas typically used for microbiological decontamination, exhaust systems containing HEPA filters require airtight dampers to be installed on both the inlet and discharge side of the filter housing. This ensures containment of the gas inside the filter housing during decontamination. 
Access panel ports in the filter housing also allow for performance testing of the HEPA filter. HEPA filters are typically constructed of paper-thin sheets of borosilicate medium, pleated to increase surface area, and affixed to a frame. Filters may be constructed as separatorless, or contain aluminum separators for stability. A bag-in, bag-out filter assembly can be used in situations where HEPA filtration is necessary for operations involving biohazardous materials and hazardous or toxic chemicals. This protects the technician handling the filter as well as the environment. The bag-in, bag-out system is used when it's not possible to decontaminate the HEPA filters with formaldehyde gas or when hazardous toxic chemicals have been used in the BSC. Note. The bag-in, bag-out requirement must be identified at the time of purchase and installation. A bag-in, bag-out assembly, available only on B1 and B2 cabinets, cannot be added to a cabinet after the fact. A biological safety cabinet must be certified by a qualified individual at the following times. Initial installation. It is extremely important that all new biological safety cabinets be certified when they are received from the manufacturer. Failure to do so may lead to the use of a cabinet which is not functioning appropriately and cause the owner to pay for repairs which should be covered under the purchasing agreement. Relocating a BSC may break the HEPA filter seals or otherwise damage the filters or the cabinet. After a major repair, such as replacement of HEPA filters or motor, each BSC should be tested and certified at least annually so it is operating properly. On-site testing following the recommendations for field testing must be performed by experienced, qualified personnel. Some basic information is included here to assist in understanding the frequency and kinds of tests to be performed. It is strongly recommended that accredited field certifiers be used to test and certify biological safety cabinets whenever possible. If in-house personnel are performing the certifications, then these individuals should become accredited. The importance of proper certification cannot be emphasized enough, since persons who manipulate infectious microorganisms are at increased risk of acquiring an occupational illness when their biological safety cabinets are functioning improperly. The annual tests applicable to each of the three classes of biological safety cabinets are extremely important. There is also information regarding the conduct of selected tests. Biological safety cabinets perform consistently well when proper annual certification procedures are followed. Cabinet or filter failures tend to occur infrequently. Biological safety cabinets are the primary containment device that protects the worker, product, and environment from exposure to microbiological agents. Performance of biosafety cabinetry is viable to ensure maximum protection and minimize contamination. Performance specifications have been established by NSF ANSI Standard 49 for the evaluation of Class II laminar flow biological safety cabinets. Various tests have been established within these standards to confirm your biological safety cabinet is operating at a standard level. Tests such as downflow and inflow velocity, airflow smoke patterns, filter leak, light intensity, vibration, noise level, and ultraviolet light integrity should be performed by an accredited field certifier at least on an annual basis to certify the integrity of your biosafety cabinet system is running at peak performance levels. For more information on how each test is performed, please contact NewAir or NSF at nsf.org. If you have further questions about setup, preparation, operation, finishing work in the BSC, or certification, check with your industrial hygienist or biosafety officer. You can also send your questions to NewAir via email using this link, service at newair.com. Or you can visit the NewAir website for answers about biological safety cabinets. NewAir is one of the finest pieces of laboratory equipment available. Proper preparation, use, and maintenance are your assurance of protection for personnel, product, and the environment. Okay, so we now have an understanding of how biological safety cabinets work, and primarily they're using airflow and HEPA filters to keep us, the product, and the environment safe. So these are the things that we need to test to make sure that they conform. So when we come on site to do validations of BSCs, we need to do 
HEPA filter leak tests. Remember, there's two filters in a BSC. There's an exhaust filter and a downflow filter. Both of these need to be tested. There's the airflow validation test. So we need to validate that the downflow air is laminar and also at the correct velocity. We need to make sure that the inflow is correct. Remember that the inflow combined with the downflow provides that air barrier protection. So if these velocities are out of spec, it means that that air barrier is compromised. And if it's compromised, it can be either dangerous to yourself or the product. So it's critical that we make sure that the airflow velocities are as the manufacturer specifies. Then we perform another test using a smoke stick or a smoke tubes. This is designed to give us a visual idea of how the airflow in the cabinet is moving. Um, even with the, all the other tests, the filter leak tests, the velocity tests, it can, it can provide very good clues if there's a small fault, and especially if there's some interference from outside influence when we're doing the, uh, when we're doing the um, smoke visualization test. So you'll see a little bit later on, there's a video of this. That's a simple test, but it's one of the very important ones. The other tests we do are listed here. An important one is the second from the bottom is site integrity test. So especially with the type B2 cabinets, as mentioned, this includes making sure that the alarm interlock between the exhaust fan and the cabinet inside the laboratory is working and certified according to spec. It's one of the most dangerous situations you can have in any laboratory is for the exhaust fan to stop and nobody realizes that inside the lab that that inflow has disappeared and the downflow is now coming into the lab. So that's probably the most important test to do on a BSC B2. Another test which includes on the site integrity test is to make sure that on a standard BSC A2 that the safety interlocks are working there as well, primarily for the sash height. So the sash height determines the inflow velocity. If we move the sash height to the wrong position, it means that the inflow velocity will increase or decrease depending on where we've moved the sash to. And we do know that if we, if we change the inflow velocity, we have a danger of the airflow barrier is now not safe anymore. So we test to make sure that the sash height alarms are working and to also make sure that when you're using, if your cabinet's equipped with a UV light, that the UV light is not allowed to switch on while the sash is open. So we do a test to make sure that when the sash is down, the UV light comes on and then when the sash is lifted, the UV light goes off. The danger is there that if the operator is sitting in front of the cabinet with the sash open, with the white light on, it drowns the UV light if it's put on by mistake and you can get severe radiation damage, obviously, from the UV light coming up into your eyes. So that's one of the tests we do for the site integrity tests. So when these tests are all combined, it, com it um, constitutes what we call a validation. So there might be some adjustment necessary. Um, it's not effectively a calibration, it's a validation. So we do all these tests and if they pass all of them, then the cabinet's fit for purpose. So really important here is to make the point that you can't half certify a biological safety cabinet. So if somebody comes in and tests the airflow, that's good. Does a smoke test, that's good. If they don't do the HEPA filter leak test, then that cabinet is not being certified. So there's no half measures. This is your primary containment device in the lab, and it needs all these things to be tested to the level of accreditation that certifies that the personnel know what they're doing and then the cabinet is safe. It's a, it's a point I make often is that you're the person sitting in front of that cabinet. So it's not the certifier, it's not the, the people sitting in offices, it's you. So I would make sure that the cabinet that you're sitting in front of complies and is validated correctly according to the stickers. So one of the tests we do, this is the HEPA filter leak test. Um, it's quite a technical test, it involves some really high-end equipment. The basic principle behind it is that we had a graph a little bit earlier showing that HEPA filters have a, the challenge for a HEPA filter is a particle of 0 0.3 micron. If it can, if it can stop that particle, then it stops all other particles. So we perform that test by producing an aerosol of 0 0.3 micron and 
we introduce this aerosol into the airstream and then we use a scanning photometer to check how much penetration of the aerosol is coming through the filter. So in this case, on the right-hand side is the aerosol generator. It produces only 0.3 micron particles, billions of them. And we introduce this into the airstream. So this is now effectively bombarding the HEPA filters with this 0.3 micron challenge. And then we use what we call an aerosol photometer, which is a laser photometer with a scanning probe. And with this, we measure on the downside of the filter how much of that aerosol is coming through. So there's an allowable percentage of 0.01% allowed of that aerosol is allowed through. Anything more than that, it means that the filter, or perhaps the filter seal is leaking. Uh, sometimes we can, we can fix some of the leaks with the seals. Um, if it's leaking on the media, then obviously then the HEPA filter needs to be replaced. This is the downflow filter. Important to remember there's two filters on a BSC. The exhaust filter needs to be tested too. So we've done the HEPA filter test. The other important parameters to measure are the airflow. So this device is what we call a thermal hot wire anemometer. It's a very sensitive device for measuring velocities at a spot point. And with this, we measure a grid of generally 21 points on a normal size cabinet. And these must conform to the manufacturer's specifications. They need to be within accuracy and also with the, we don't want readings higher than the others. So we, we take a percentage across the grid. And if we have a 25% deviance of more, then it means that the air is not laminar inside. So it's quite a meticulous test that needs to be carried out with this equipment. This is performing now the downflow velocity tests. Then we also need to test the inflow. So we generally have two methods of testing the inflow. Uh, the challenge here is that the inflow does not travel uniformly into the cabinet through the aperture. We saw from the first slides that the air actually disappears down into the front grill. So we need to be able to measure accurately what the airflow velocity is there. Sorry, we're just waiting for the next slide. So the another test which we do is the smoke test. This is the one where we look for the visualization of what the airflow is actually doing. So for this, we use smoke sticks. So what we call an air tube, it's a chemical inside. It's a safe smoke, uh, which can be used in the lab. So we basically, we we break open the we break open the uh, the tubes. We position them into a little glass, uh, sorry, a little a rubber bulb, and the, with, with this now we can produce a static. It's important here that we produce what we call a static smoke sample, not with any velocity. So what we're wanting to do here is introduce the smoke and then see what happens to it. So the first one we we perform is a downflow test. What's what we're looking for here is that the the smoke is going downwards and not reflux, refluxing up from the work surface. So you can see it's a fairly simple test, but it gives us a very good idea that the airflow patterns inside the cabinet are laminar, not, in other words, not turbulent, and that the smoke is um, being drawn downwards or being pushed downwards in a laminar fashion and being drawn into the back end of the intake block. Another test that we do is to make sure that the view screen or the sliding sash is not allowing any of the air out into the laboratory. So we produce a smoke sample close to the front end of the screen and we make sure that none of it curls up back into the lab. These tests are normally the tests that we do first because we can immediately see that the cabinet's airflow is basically working correctly. The work opening edge retention test, this is the one where we are looking at the smoke going into the front of the grill. The primarily, what we're looking for here, first of all, is that the, the smoke is being 
drawn into the front of the grill and not pushed back into the lab. And also that the smoke is not being drawn over the grill onto the work surface, which would provide contamination of the sample. The most common cause of failure here is external influences on the airflow, generally an air conditioning unit blowing quite strongly across the front of the cabinet. And then you'll see that the smoke uh, starts making vortexes and swirling around and actually comes back into the lab sometimes. So this is actually a really important test to make sure that our site positioning was correct and that we don't have an external air um, uh, something pr pr uh, producing an external air influence. And then the last test here is just to make sure that the seals on the sash, on the sliding sash, are not leaking. So we produce a smoke sample in between the seal and the chassis and check that no smoke comes into the lab. So four simple tests, but really important to make sure that the airflow is correct in the lab. So now we're just gonna provide you with a video with some operational techniques, tips and tricks on how to work on a validated cabinet. Each laboratory should develop or adopt a biosafety operations manual, which identifies the hazards that will or may be encountered, and specifies practices and procedures designed to minimize or eliminate risks. Laboratory personnel must receive appropriate training on potential hazards associated with the work involved, including the necessary precautions to prevent exposures and how to react to an exposure. The laboratory director should establish policies and procedures so that only those who have been advised of the potential hazard and meet specific entry requirements, such as immunization, are permitted to enter the laboratory or animal rooms. There's more to safely turning on your BSC than simply flipping a switch. Cabinet blowers should be operated at least three to five minutes before beginning work to allow the cabinet to purge. This purge will remove any particulates in the cabinet. Make sure the work surface, interior walls, and surface of the window are disinfected. Also, the ultraviolet germicidal lamp is an important ally, but should not be solely relied on to provide a clean and disinfected work area. This goes for your work materials as well. The surfaces of all materials and containers placed into the cabinet should be disinfected. This simple step will reduce introduction of mold spores and thereby minimize contamination of cultures. You can further reduce the presence of microbes on materials used in your biological safety cabinets by periodically decontaminating incubators, refrigerators, and or nearby equipment. It's important to prepare a written checklist of materials necessary for a particular activity. Know what you're working with. Place everything needed to complete your job inside the cabinet prior to beginning work. This minimizes the number of arm movement disruptions across the fragile air barrier of the cabinet. If possible, keep physical activity in the lab to a bare minimum. Too much movement past the cabinet can disturb the cabinet's airflow. Air intake to your BSC is also very important. Remove any items on the intake grills that might block or disrupt the air supply. And be sure the front grill is not blocked, covered, or obstructed. All materials should be placed as far back in the cabinet as possible, toward the rear edge of the work surface and away from the front grill of the cabinet, but still within reach. Similarly, aerosol generating equipment should be placed toward the rear of the cabinet to take advantage of the air split. It's important to wait for at least one minute before working with material inside the cabinet, allowing the cabinet to stabilize and air sweep the hands and arms, removing contaminants. Make sure extra supplies such as gloves, culture plates, or flasks are stored outside the cabinet. Only the materials and equipment required for the immediate work should be placed in the cabinet's work area. Upright pipette collection containers should not be used in biological safety cabinets or placed on the floor outside the cabinet. 
The frequent inward-outward movement needed to place objects in these containers is disruptive to the integrity of the cabinet air barrier and can compromise both personnel and product protection. Only horizontal pipette discard trays containing an appropriate chemical disinfectant should be used within the cabinet. Mouth pipetting is prohibited. Only mechanical pipetting devices must be used. All procedures must be performed carefully to minimize the creation of splashes or aerosols. Proper dress is another essential for protection of personnel, product, and the environment. Laboratory coats should be worn buttoned over street clothing. Protective eyewear should be on at all times, and latex or nitrile gloves are necessary when handling culture, contaminated surfaces, or equipment. Finally, laboratory equipment and work surfaces should be decontaminated with an appropriate disinfectant on a routine basis. This is important after work with infectious materials, and especially after overt spills, splashes, or contamination by infectious materials. So just another point just to make here while we've got a slide on with the UV light, just to remember, I think I mentioned it earlier that UV lights work on line of sight only. So in this cabinet, the material has been removed, so the sterilization can take place. But if you do leave any material work uh, equipment inside the cabinet, just to remember that anything underneath that equipment or gloves or pet tips or whatever it might be, or if it's casting a shadow, those areas are not being sterilized by UV light. Um, UV lights also do have a lifespan. Um, they can appear to be working. They switch on, they have this purple color, but in fact, the energy levels coming out of them are, are almost on zero level. So it's important to replace them generally on an annual basis um, and not to rely on them primarily as the, as the primary form of sterilization. Use normal good uh, laboratory practices, 70% ethanol, as they demonstrated in the uh, video earlier and just rely on them as a backup. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, just in terms of our product offering for biological safety cabinets, um, we do have three primary brands that we offer in stock. And the reason for this variety of cabinets is that we wanna be able to meet the various needs of the end user, be it preference in terms of like um, how the display might work or um, be it application or obviously um, budget constraints. So feel free to reach out to us if you ever have a question on the actual products that we have available in terms of biological safety cabinets. Okay, now we're gonna get into questions and answers. I'm just gonna bring my screen across here. All right, so Steve, um, we had quite a few questions on um, certification and on requirements for certification. So the first question was, is field certification of biological safety cabinets regulated or required according to the local and regional uh, requirements or guidelines? So it does depend on specifically the customer's requirements. Generally, um, they will determine which, which uh, level of accreditation they need to be certified to. It differs from country to country. In South Africa, we have the um, USABS standard. It's not a legal requirement. It's up to the customer to decide, will they need it for an audit? Do they need it for their own um, SOPs? So that's determined by on a, on a specific basis. What is important to mention is that the people who are coming to do the accreditation should have some form of uh, certificate of competency to make sure that they are doing these tests correctly. Um, that's the most important part of field certification and obviously that the equipment being used is certified and the correct equipment. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is related, uh, and I think we did cover it in, especially in the video that you showed in terms of the tools that we have for certification. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But somebody asked if there is a comprehensive list of test tools required for certification. Yes, there is. So the primary, the primary test that we do, we need to do HEPA filter testing, we need to do airflow velocity testing, and we need to do smoke visualization testing and site integrity. So for HEPA filter testing, you need to use 
two pieces of equipment, the aerosol generator and the laser photometer. That's the requirement for the HEPA filter testing. For the, for the airflow velocities, you need a hot wire thermal anemometer for the probe. And for the smoke visualization, smoke pencils, or, or preferably the smoke tubes, the Drager smoke tubes. So mm -hmm. with those pieces of equipment, you can perform the five primary tests. There are some other tests which are more for personal comfort, like noise integrity, background lighting, vibration. Generally, those are not required to be done in the field unless a customer requests them. So those four, those uh, five primary tests need those pieces of equipment. We can forward a list of the specifications for those, but that's what you would need to do for validation. You can't do half of it. You can't just measure airflow or just do the smoke. What mm -hmm. some customers do is they, they purchase the, the uh, smoke tubes just to do an in-house uh, verification that the airflow is more or less okay. Yeah. It's a lot better than a piece of tissue paper on the on the sash. So that's <laughs> quite an important little tool to use because it at least shows that you've got inflow, downflow, uh, whether it's not going to measure the velocities, but on a well-maintained um, cabinet, these things, they don't normally go out of calibration that quickly. So a very important test for a B2 cabinet would be the smoke test to make sure that you're getting inflow, just to make sure that the exhaust, the exhaust fan is working. And we recommend actually quite thoroughly to a B2 operator that they have some way of checking that the inflow is more or less correct using these smoke sticks. Hmm. But yes, there is a list for, for these tests. You need to do all of them. Um, no half measures. Right. So um, there was actually a question on the smoke testing, um, especially the smoke test from Drager. Uh, mm -hmm. In terms of frequency, how often should you be doing that smoke test? Obviously, it's an end user just wanting to verify that the airflow yeah. is correct. Yeah. So these, these kits come with 10 glass tubes in them. Um, when you open the one, they have little caps on them so you can use them. But unfortunately, they exhaust after about two days. So your lab would have to determine how many of these replacement sticks they would want to use. But some labs do it once a week. Um, I think once a day would be quite excessive on the use of the, of the glass tubes. There are other ways of testing it. They're, we have smoke pencils, which are basically a wick, which you light. Um, more sustainable for the quick checks. We don't use them for our validations because we need a, a higher concentration of, of uh, static smoke. Mm. But uh, if that's a more efficient or more economical way of doing it, then maybe that's a, a solution. It's a pencil that you you basically just extend the wick and light it, and it produces a it produces a, a smaller amount of smoke, but still satisfactory to do those uh, at least three of the tests. It's not very good to do the sash seal test, but certainly the inflow, the downflow, and the, and the, the sash retention test. Okay, great. That's that's great advice, because I think the, the concern was, in terms of budget, it's quite yeah. expensive to use the it Drager is. test. It is. The thing is with the Drager testing is that if you've got um, maybe 10 cabinets in your facility, and you want to do them all once a month, then it's a good option, because then you can break the stick and you can do all 10. Yeah. And then use another one the next month but if you if you feel the need to do it more often than that then i think the smoke stick uh, the wick burning one would probably mm -hmm. be a better option just for you can do you can do that daily it's a very cheap uh, item you know you can replace the wick it's basically like a looks like a shoelace basically just pull it out and, and uh, a smoke pencil um so the obvious question that's come through is where can people buy the smoke pencil <laughs> So that we can send them on a link. Uh, we do have some. We do have some. Uh, they do have some outlets. I don't have all of them in my head, but we can yeah, certainly no. supply them. <laughs> okay. we can send, they, they're freely available, and we can send whoever's requesting. We can send them the, the information. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So um, for those that are interested, you could just send your email address. Um, to the panelists and then we'll get back to you with some links on where you can obtain those. Um, then the last question that's come through is what are some of the daily maintenance things that you should be doing with your biological safety cabinet? So the main the main concern that you need to do is make sure it's kept clean. So good, good laboratory practice as was demonstrated in the last video. That's the uh, keeping it 
keeping it in good operational condition. It's not possible for the operator to do air velocity checks or HEPA filter checks or things like that, obviously. Um, of use would be that smoke pencil to do a, there you could do a daily test to make sure that the airflow is okay. Uh, an often neglected cleaning procedure is to lift the work table. I think a lot of um, operators are a bit scared to lift it. They're not sure if they're allowed to or not allowed to. It's designed, most of them with handles, so it gives you a clue that it's meant to be taken out. So that can be removed and often underneath you'll find some disasters underneath there. So it's, a, it's, a, mm. it's one of the often forgotten cleaning procedures. It's not just to disinfect with alcohol on the top of the work table, but to actually lift the work table that comes out and clean underneath thoroughly. Otherwise you can get sources of contamination there or even corrosion. Um, so yeah, include that in your daily, weekly cleaning routine. Um, other than that, it's just the 70% you know, ethanol, obviously more effective than the 100%. Um, what can cause a little bit of damage is a lot of labs use hypochloride-based cleaning agents like bleach, and this can attack the work table. So if you are, if you're needing to use this as a disinfectant, then it's a good idea to, well, not a good idea, just uh, do clean the work table off afterwards with some ethanol to make sure that there's no residue of that bleach agent sitting on the work table because it does, it forms small corrosive points and where you have that corrosive point, you have a source of contamination, which is then difficult to get rid of. Okay. I lied when I said it was the last question. There's still a few okay. more that have come through. No worries. Um, <laughs> So the one that I thought was actually interesting to get your take on is, um, have you noticed a higher awareness of biological safety cabinet field certification after the pandemic? Definitely. I think it comes from two places because the suppliers who are supplying new cabinets want to make sure that the new equipment has been certified correctly mm -hmm. um, on, on, on installation because an incorrectly installed cabinet is a dangerous piece of equipment. You know, people are relying on this for their safety and they're relying on the, on the operation to be safe. And if it's positioned or not installed correctly, a good example is if that um, the cabinet is shipped from America or from Asia or wherever it comes from and put into place in a laboratory in a, in a lab and not tested, there's a there's a good, not a good chance, but it obviously can happen that during shipment, those HEPA filters have shifted or the seals have been broken and they're leaking. So on a brand new cabinet, if you don't test it, it can be really unsafe. Mm. So I think that's why one of the, uh, there's a heightened awareness of installation requirements that it's been installed correctly. And with the COVID uh, situation, like everybody's at a much higher level of biosafety awareness. Yeah. So I think, um, I think there's been pressure from the operators on lab management to make sure that these cabinets are now correctly validated. They don't go over their due date, all these small things, because as I mentioned, it's the operator sitting in front of it who's at the risk. So, mm -hmm. you know, they need to be, take a little bit of, uh, take responsibility to make sure that the cabinet you're working in front of is safe. Right. However you've managed to do that. But certainly there is a higher, higher awareness now. Uh, with that comes an added risk of more people trying to do these tests. Um, there's a monetary thing attached to it, obviously. So also be careful that the people who are doing the certification are, they don't necessarily have to have an NSF 49 accreditation. There's not many of them in Africa, but they need to demonstrate some sort of competency and use the correct equipment that's certified. Yeah. Um, so there were a few questions about um, engineers available for Nigeria, um, our ability to train users of products in countries outside of South Africa. So I'll address that very quickly that yes, we can do that. Um, Steve Smith has a team of engineers that work with him and under him that travel extensively throughout Africa. So we, anytime we install a cabinet, we do training and validation, but we can also do repeat training of users, um, especially if we're in country uh, working mm -hmm. on something else, then we can add it onto their trip quite easily. Um, yeah, but yes, we do, we do handle recertification throughout um, Africa. Just, just to add to that, so I 
personally, I think we've been to 34 countries and I work in those countries on a, on a yearly basis. But I've done a lot of training on the engineers in many countries. So we, we host a lot of training sessions at facilities, mm. specifically on biological safety cabinets. Um, it can be to the engineering, down to the engineering level, which takes about a week. We, we organize these courses depending on what the customer requires. So often it's added on to the annual validation of the cabinets that needs to be done anyway. And then we add an additional section to say, once we're here, we can give practical and theoretical training to whoever needs it in the uh, in the in, in the facility, and they find it really useful because then um, you know they have sometimes then an engineer on site. You can perform smaller tests between the validation, but it also just gives everybody a much greater awareness of how these things work because it's an often misunderstood unit. So that we can do, we do it on a regular basis. We do validations on in, in basically any country in sub-Saharan Africa, even further up than that. And we do it regularly. As you said, Carly, we have, that's what our international service unit does. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I think we're gonna make this the last question, but if anybody else has more comments or questions, you're welcome to email us directly. You can email sales at lasik.com or you can email Astrid Mayer if you want a copy of the presentation. You can also email sales at LASIK, it'll eventually um, come back to her. So if you would like a recording of this webinar, then you can request it and we will send it on to you. So the last question that we're gonna to cover today is, um, are all the tests applicable to laminar flows without sashes? So, Laminar flows without sashes. Uh, so the laminar flow terminology means that we're not dealing with a biological safety cabinet. That's a very important yeah. distinction to make. So a laminar flow without a sash is generally remembering it's for it's for your product protection only. So that it, it has one airflow, it doesn't have an inflow, only has a downflow. The basic operation is air from the laboratory through a HEPA filter and then out into the lab. So the test that we do on a BSC is different to what we do on a laminar flow. Mm -hmm. the, the test, the main test we do on a laminar flow, we need to check obviously the integrity of the HEPA filter. So that test is the same, with slight variation. We use the same equipment to make sure that the HEPA filter is not leaking. And then we do measure the uh, airflow velocity, but only the one airflow velocity. So it's a shortened version of the bi biological safety cabinet test, the prim primary one being the testing of the HEPA filter. What I've found is that most of the failures on laminar flows is due to the incorrect use of Bunsen burners. Mm. So <laughs> operators are using the wrong type of Bunsen burner, the old ones that we have at school. And especially with the, um, with the vertical uh, laminar flows, when they switch on that plume of heat goes up and it damages the, he the HEPA filter really quickly. So uh, I can often see if I see a, if I see an old style Bunsen burner in the cabinet, I know it's going to fail. Mm. So important to know that if you need to use a Bunsen burner, you need to buy the correct. Kylie has more information on that. There's a specific types of Bunsen burners we use in BSCs. They electronically control flames, but uh, the older type ones are they're going to cause damage to the filters eventually. Yeah. Yes. So we do do testing on them. Um, but not to the same extent as the BSCs. Okay, great. I think we're going to end it there. Thank you so much for all of the participation and the interest in the topic that's been covered. Uh, as I said, you're welcome to reach out to us if you have any more questions that come up uh, while you rethink about what you've learned in this webinar. Um, thanks, Steve, for spending some time with us. Um, I know you have a really busy schedule flying all around Africa, but we, we're happy that we could borrow you for um, a little bit of time to, to awesome. gain from your great. expertise. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, further. everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.